Ukrainian FPV drone slammed into the convoy's ammunition load at 2.49 p.m. Everything on that bridge disappeared inside a blinding flash. The copper jet from the shaped charge punched straight into the stacked 152 mm rounds riding in the truck bed. Eight shells cooked off at once. A shockwave tore through the bridge deck, lifting the vehicle nearly two meters into the air. The structure, already weakened from previous strikes, cracked under the pressure and gave way. The truck, the artillery piece it was towing, and everything around it slid off the broken edge and tumbled into the river below. Above the chaos, the Shark D reconnaissance drone continued to orbit, capturing the entire collapse in crisp, high definition. Russian soldiers stood frozen, staring at the ruin of their crossing as smoke rose 200 meters into the sky. The nearest alternate bridge was 15 kilometers away. A single 7-inch drone had broken through three layers of defenses that had already eliminated more than 30 Ukrainian drones in that area. But this was not an accident, and it certainly wasn't luck. This was the final moment of a battle that actually began on November 18th at 2.30 p.m. A battle shaped by mathematics, electromagnetic warfare, machine learning, and the instincts of operators who live under constant threat. The Ukrainian team launched what should have been a routine strike mission. The Shark D drone circled above a badly damaged bridge, an ideal choke point. Below it, a Russian convoy crawled forward at 15 km per H, towing a 152 mm howitzer through twisted metal and fractured concrete. On paper, an easy target, but almost immediately a problem emerged. The Ukrainian drone wasn't hunting anymore, it was being hunted. Every moment the shark transmitted video was a beacon, announcing, here I am, to anyone watching the electromagnetic spectrum, and the Russians were definitely watching. They had deployed the Zupark-1 counter-battery radar. The system was never designed for drones. Its original purpose was to detect artillery shells in flight, calculate their trajectory, identify the firing point, and guide return fire. But Russian operators adapted it. A drone's control link is just another radio signal. Radio signals can be detected, bearings can be taken. Three bearings from three positions give a triangulated point. And three minutes after that point is known, artillery begins landing on it. Ukrainian operators understood the math. Stay in one spot transmitting for longer than five minutes, and there was a roughly 40% chance you'd never send another transmission again. The Russians even had a name for this tactic, counter-reconnaissance by fire. No visual confirmation needed, just detect, calculate, and devastate. So the Ukrainian team adapted. They executed frequency hopping across 128 channels every second. They transmitted in tiny bursts, only 0.3 seconds of data, then complete silence for about 30 seconds. Long enough to maintain control, too short for ZUP Park 1 to lock onto their location. Then things escalated. Thermal sensors detected a Russian Orlan 10 reconnaissance drone approaching from the north. That drone's payload can detect human thermal signatures at approximately 2 km under clear conditions. Its appearance meant one thing. The Russians believed operators were nearby and had dispatched their airborne hunter. The team faced a brutal choice. They could stay visible, keep eyes on the convoy, and risk detection. Or they could hide under thermal blankets, go completely blind, and hope the strike team didn't lose situational awareness. Survival came first. They hid. But before they covered themselves, they needed to pass the latest target information to the FPV team four kilometers away. A standard radio call would have exposed both teams, so they used something far more elegant. The shark dropped a digital breadcrumb, one tiny encrypted packet on 433 MEDs outside typical UAS control watch bands. It carried GPS coordinates, convoy speed, wind data, and the best attack vector. 0.3 seconds below the time needed for multi-site bearing correlation. Too encrypted to decode, on the wrong band to even notice. The FPV team received the packet. At 2.45 p.m., the strike drone powered up. Seven inch carbon fiber frame, two kilogram shaped charge, battery at 16.8 volts, enough power for seven minutes of flight. And the target was only four minutes away. On paper, a straightforward strike. The first two kilometers went smoothly. 
The drone skimmed just three meters above the ground, weaving between tree lines and ruins. The video feed came through at 1080p and 60 frames per second. But then, at exactly two kilometers out, everything began breaking down. Static slashed across the screen. The frame rate crashed. The Repellent One mobile jammer had locked onto the area. The jammer was a high-power broadband jammer, saturating nearby bands. 400 watts of raw electromagnetic interference, blasting every frequency in a 500-meter bubble. At two kilometers, the signal strength was still strong enough to drown the drone's 25-milliwatt transmitter. The Ukrainians shifted to 433 megahertz again. It wasn't protected, it wasn't pretty, but it was outside the main jamming bands. The image came back in grainy, flickering bursts, more like a decade-old flip phone recording than a modern feed. At 1.5 kilometers, even that backup frequency began to die. The Russians weren't relying on a single jammer. They had layers, vehicle-mounted repellent. One system's portable trench jammers every 200 meters, and somewhere behind their lines, likely a Pole 21 area denial array. Three systems, overlapping frequencies, creating an electronic black hole. But the Ukrainians came prepared. The drone carried an onboard AI module trained on 10,000 hours of combat footage. It could identify vehicles, lock onto shapes, and fly autonomously toward a target. But it needed to see the target cleanly for at least two seconds from within 400 meters. The operator had to guide it blindly through the jamming zone until it reached that distance. He flew on instruments alone. Altitude, three meters. Speed, 45 kilometers per hour. Slower than ideal, but necessary to conserve battery while flying essentially blind. For exactly one frame, one sixtieth of a second, the image flickered back. It showed the bridge roughly 800 meters away. Then the picture vanished again. But that single frame was enough. He was on track. 400 more meters of blind flight, and the AI could take over if the drone reached that point alive. At three kilometers out, another gap in the jamming caused the video to return temporarily this time crystal clear. And in those brief seconds, the operator saw a new threat, a Russian interceptor drone about 20 meters up, already diving at a 45 degree angle. It was coming down in a 45 degrees diving attack with a speed advantage. Both drones were nearly identical. Seven inch frames, four motors, capable of hitting 140 kilometers per H. But the Russian drone held the advantage. Height meant energy, energy meant speed and speed meant options. Closing velocity, 280 kilometers per hour. Separation, 300 meters. Time to impact, under four seconds. The Ukrainian drone was carrying a two kilogram warhead, making it sluggish. In drone combat, that's like boxing with a backpack loaded with bricks. The Ukrainian operator broke hard left, pulling nearly five Gs. The frame groaned. Motors screamed unevenly as the drone yawed violently. He managed to force the interceptor to overshoot, but the dodge consumed precious battery power. Voltage dropped rapidly, 15.2 to 14.8 in 10 seconds. The Russian operator changed tactics, climbing again to reset the attack. The Ukrainian drone couldn't follow. The battery was too low, the weight was too high. Then the Ukrainian operator pulled a move he had practiced, but rarely used. He cut throttle completely. The drone dropped from 15 meters to three in two seconds. The interceptor plunged through empty air where it expected its target to be. Cutting throttle came with consequences. With no power, the drone fell like a brick and temporarily lost control authority. The operator had to restore power gently, bringing the throttle to 30% to arrest the fall without flipping from torque. The Russian drone pulled out of its dive and began circling for another pass. Now, both drones were at similar energy levels. Low altitude, moderate speed, batteries draining. They entered a tight turning fight. The interceptor had the better power to weight ratio since it carried no warhead, allowing it to pull six Gs. The Ukrainian drone maxed out at around 4.5. With each aggressive maneuver, the Russian drone gained angles. It slipped closer to the Ukrainian drone's blind spot. The operator had one last trick left, a vertical reversal. He pushed full throttle. The drone shot upward at 10 meters per second, killing all forward momentum. At the peak, it hung nearly motionless. 
cut throttle and slammed full yaw, spinning the drone 180 degrees in less than a second, flipping it nose down towards the climbing interceptor. The Russian pilot committed to collision. That was his mission. But the Ukrainian operator rolled hard right at the last instant and dove away. The interceptor passed within meters of empty space. By the time the Russian drone corrected its trajectory, the Ukrainian drone had already leveled out at five meters altitude and was racing toward the bridge. The entire dogfight lasted 18 seconds. It burned through about 30% of the battery. Voltage sat at 14.5 volts. Only 8% capacity remained. Russian soldiers on the bridge had heard the buzzing chaos and prepared their weapons. At 50 meters out, an AK-74 opened fire at 650 rounds per minute. One 5.45mm bullet punched through the carbon fiber frame and severed the rear left motor's power leads. The drone lurched sideways. With three motors left, it lost 25% of its thrust. A shotgunner fired next. The Saiga 12 launched a cloud of 65 pellets. Most missed. Two didn't. One destroyed the right front motor entirely. Another pierced the battery casing. Voltage fell off a cliff, 14.5 to 13.8 to 13.2 in two seconds. The drone was down to two motors. Speed dropped to 80 kilometers per hour. Altitude sagged dangerously. A third soldier tried to fire, but couldn't depress his weapon low enough. The drone skimmed only 1.5 meters above the ground. At 10 meters out, the AI made its final calculations. The operator wanted the cab to ignite the ammunition and end the mission decisively. Battery at 12.8 V, below programmed minimum. Emergency override held, thrust collapsing. The magnetic proximity sensor armed itself. Impact came at two hours, 49 minutes and 47 seconds PM. The drone hit at just 62 kilometers per hour, far slower than optimal. But the shaped charge didn't need speed. It needed proximity. The copper jet formed perfectly and drove straight into the ammunition stack. Eight artillery shells detonated at once. The explosion lifted the vehicle, cracked the failing bridge deck and sent the convoy into the river. The Shark D continued circling above, recording the smoke, the collapsing bridge, and the stunned Russian soldiers. The alternate crossing sat 15 kilometers away. This is the new state of warfare. Signals reveal positions, forces adapt to exploit them. Every moment is observed, and somewhere, another operator is waiting with another seven inch drone, ready for the next moment.